Minnesota is a separate country all its own. <laughs> this is true. I got lost there one time. Yeah, one time it was the third largest city in the United States. Yeah, it's a separate city. Yeah, it became part of New York. Yeah. They, they were what you wore on the alcohol, too. They're that comfortable. I used to be a self employed I used to be a sales manager of a chemical company. I went up to New York about five, six times a year. Well, that's cool that Barbara Chris are coming. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Hostile audience. Friends, friends, and, <laughs> friends and, <laughs> and these are my grandchildren. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. She was a definite maybe. Uh -huh. She has seen this talk before. Mm -hmm. uh, as has Brenda. Brenda slept through some of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. My problem is I go 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 Turn off the lights, that all right. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the ones that are here in Maplewood at the park, yeah, um, they have been them? so active all winter long and like into spring, hey, uh, into fall, here into winter, winter early spring. spring. Hey guys, hi, how you doing? Okay, good to see you. Come, come on up. Welcome, more friends. Great, excellent. How you, how you been? How are you? I'm fine, how are you? Okay. Good. Good. What park are they Um, There's a little park uh, on a street called Circle Drive, right off of Manchester. So if you're going Manchester West, you'll cross over the Fleet Station Road, and the next little street, if you miss it, it's gone, is Circle. You go down there, and there's a, a park, it used to be houses, and uh, it's right not too far from the Metrolink station and the dog park. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's right by the Metrolink. After the, actually, after the the first talk I did here, January 2013, um, a lady and her family who live right there um, took us there, and we didn't see anything that night. But they they were seeing them and hearing them. I've regular, actually seen regularly. them in a tree that's right behind a house across the street from us. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I actually made my husband stop. Look. He's like, what? Oh. <laughs> and they're great work too. Yeah. 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 And they are very vocal. Good. Very vocal. So. Have you seen youngsters? No. I'm blanking on the lady's name. She, she was. Angela. Uh, Angela. Angela. That's yeah. right. I was hoping she'd be here tonight. Give me her update as well. I'm glad to get yours. Yeah. So I haven't been able to see any owl list, but there's two of them out there. So. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. My sister does. I need to ask. Hey, Barb. Hey, Barb. Hey, Barb. Hey, Barb. Happy birthday, girl. Hi. How's it going? Good. Go look. Yes. She lives right here. Huh? Right. And when I told her that you said that the. Well, let me move up. Yeah. I'm all by myself. Oh, okay. Did you help any? Anyway, just thought you got Oh, the same thing. Same thing. But does anybody know where they go? And it looks like they may have left the park. The, the whole family crashes with like temporary relocation. Yeah, one of the pairs, the pairs on the north side of the park, they may have moved down just across the way. To <laughs> So where is that? Oh, in the yeah. corner. Watch this space. Yeah. 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 But that 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 could change. Um, I haven't met for a while someone who would follow those owls. So it's close to Brenda watches hers, and it's close to Charles Charles is there. Yeah, one more, but yeah, that was fine. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to go ahead and let Mark get started. It sounds like most of you know Mark. Who doesn't know Mark? Okay. Well, I'll just give you a little info. This is Mark's third uh, visit to us. Fourth. Fourth? Fourth. Really? Fourth, yeah. Three last year, first this year. That's right. That's right. I remember now. Yeah. So, um, he just loves what he does. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. It makes you want to look for owls. <laughs> So um, I'm going to let him just share what he's been observing this year. Thank you all for coming. Sorry, it's a little warm in here. Um, there are restrooms on the lower level. They're at the end of that hallway. 
And in order to get in the restrooms, you do need a key, which are at the desk on the way to the hallway. So um, again, thank you all for coming. And uh, if you need anything, Sam's at the desk and, and also Austin. And uh, they know that if we need more chairs, we can get them. So, awesome. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Don. And thank you, everyone, for coming out. I know a uh, weekday evening can be challenging sometimes, uh, especially at the beginning of the week. We're all busy. We've got lots of things going on. Um, and hopefully we'll miss the rain, or it will miss us. Um, as Oscar Wilde said about not working, you know, we won't have to look for work, and it won't have to look for us. <laughs> um, this is the third or fourth time I've given this particular talk, which is all on mating, nesting, and analysis. Actually, the first time I ever did it was here at the, the Maplewood Public Library. Uh, so I'm happy to be doing it again. I think I've gotten a little better with it. I'm always honing my talks, even my general talk, which I know some of you have seen before, uh, if not multiple times. Um, but I always want to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, some of you I am meeting for the first time. Uh, others of you are more familiar with your work. But for those of you who are new, you might be uh, a little puzzled. You might be asking yourself, you know, I thought we were going to hear about great horned owls. Uh, look at this guy. Surely there must be mis some mistake. Look at his rather sparsely covered head. Surely he should be studying bald eagles. <laughs> Well, there is no mistake. I like bald eagles. This year was the best year we've had, uh, in my experience, of seeing bald eagles in Forest Park. Um, but no, I do study great horned owls. And please, please, stop calling me Shirley. <laughs> Those are Shirley's, of different ages and stages and professions and so forth. Uh, while there's a great variety of them, I think it's uh, quite clear that I am not one of them. Um, another little note is about clothes. You see me here wearing proper attire for presenting at uh, a library and to uh, a guest audience such as yourselves. Uh, but trust me, this is not what I wear when I go to the park. Shiny shoes, a jacket, and a bright white shirt have their proper place here, but no, in the park, that's what I'm wearing. Dark, muted colors, ready for mud, boots, cameras, binoculars, hats. Uh, just yesterday, uh, I made a transition here and uh, as of Saturday, I have my winter plumage, full beard. <laughs> this is kind of my spring or transitional plumage, uh, maybe like eclipse plumage, like a male wood duck has. Uh, this will eventually go down to clean shaven for the summer, and that will be my summer plumage. Uh, yes, that is my car, Alman uh, is what fit. The Alman, as people call me, just simply would not fit. So that is another way to find me in the park. Um, quick note on the photos, all the photos you're going to see, um, except for maybe one or two, um, I took, but the taking of the photos and who took them is not really what I want to emphasize. What I really want to emphasize is that all these pictures were taken in Forest Park of wild animals, not the zoo. I have had a few people think that I just go to the zoo every day and watch the owls there. Um, I have had to point out to them that for most of the year, going to the zoo to watch the animals at night would require me to break the law because I would need to break into the zoo. So no, these are, this is a law-abiding activity for the most part. Um, but I really want to emphasize how much wildlife you can find in urban parks, uh, no matter where you are. Now, when I first did this talk, it was kind of a tricky talk to put together. I thought, well, there's so many great things to talk about. It's a really good topic, but how do I approach it? Do I just talk about what's happened every year, or do I just talk about different topics? And finally, I decided to make a compromise, do a topical and chronological overview, and then do a kind of a survey of different behaviors of the owls and the youngsters and different milestones that the owlets reach as they have their long growing up process. Either way, I hope that you find it to be an awfully good time. <laughs> and not just a bunch of fluff. Um, one of the uh, real just bottom line things to know about these owls is that yes, they are two owls in this pair, Charles and Sarah. Um, and I've been watching these guys for a little over eight years. First found them in the late summer, early fall of 2005, and I've be 
been watching them consistently since late December 2005. Um, but along with that, we really want to start with just the amazing fact that they have had 21 outlets and that they have nested every year consecutively and so far successfully. And that is a testament both to the skills and abilities of Charles and Sarah as individual owls, but also as a team. They're a really good team. But it also speaks to how healthy the park is as a place for animals to live. Great horned owls, as most of you know, are right at the top of the food chain. They require a lot of food and they eat lots and lots of different things. You can't have a top of the food chain predator living in an area and reproducing successfully unless you have all the environmental and ecological building blocks. Good water, good soil, good species diversity, both of plants, grasses, forbs, and yes, wildlife. And then lastly, a big thing to keep in mind is how long their breeding cycle is. This is a picture of one of their allets in 2011. And this allet is about five to six months old and is pretty much the exact same size, height and weight, of the parents. And he's almost identical. He's still getting in some of his adult feathers, but he's still a long way from being a completely independent owl. They grow so fast, but everything else takes a long time to catch up. In human terms, they're often teenage bodies, but toddler abilities. Uh, so in some ways, kind of the worst of both worlds. Um, because of this long maturation process, they have to nest very early. And they're usually one of the first birds to nest no matter where they live, if not the first bird, first bird to nest. And out of this comes the longest breeding cycle of any owl in North America. And this whole breeding cycle, please grab a chair, don't be shy, um, takes the vast majority of the year. You know, they, everything from beginning to end, soup to nuts, as the Brits say. So the breeding cycle really begins in the late summer, early fall with Charles and Sarah hooting together in a duet. And this is a picture of them doing that. Sarah higher up on the right and Charles lower down on the left. And hooting together in a duet is believed both to be a territorial declaration, hey other owls, this is our area, please stay out, as well as a pair bonding exercise. With this really long breeding cycle, they don't have, uh, it's, it's vital I should say, they, it's vital that they have a really good pair bond so that they can stick together through thin, thick and thin. Uh, great horned owls generally mate for life, and it's both romantic and practical. It's romantic in the sense that there they are as a pair working through everything, but it's also practical. They don't have time for dating or dalliances or anything like that. So duetting is both a vocal exercise, but it's definitely a visual exercise, as we shall see. Charles will usually hoot first. And the hoots are some of the ways that you can tell them apart. A male's hoot is lower, longer, deeper notes. And usually a female's hoot is shorter, higher, softer notes, and more of them. Now sometimes, just with people, it's hard to tell who is who. If I were to call you on the phone, your brain, even if you didn't know who I was, your brain would probably say, it's a dude. This guy has a deeper typically male voice, but we've all been in those situations of, whoa, do I say sir, do I say ma'am, do I just wait for that person to identify themselves? And the, one of the coolest things about uh, duetting is that it's a very beautiful process, both visually and vocally. The visual part is demonstrated here and here and here. They puff out this area of their throat, it's called a gular sac, G-U-L-A-R, and they lift up their tail feathers. So the gular sac and the underside of the tail feathers are this bright white. Now here, it's still pretty light out, but believe me, even on a dark, 
cloudy, moonless night, you can see that, those white feathers like a beam of a lighthouse. I took some pictures of them duetting by the jewel box this year. Now, the pictures aren't going to win me any awards for clarity and sharpness because it's, it's way past sunset, but you can clearly see those white feathers like a beacon. So let's listen to a duet. This is them duetting. And Charles is higher up on the right and Sarah on the left. And notice the difference in hoot and also watch those feathers puff out and pop up. It's, now, like... It says Charles on left, Sarah on right. The Thank you for the correction, Pip. Uh, I will fix that. Not write this thing. Um, a duet is like any other conversation. It begins slow, starts fast, uh, and then eventually gets faster. In this video, they're kind of in about second gear. So many different aspects of their lives and different behaviors that they do, it simply doesn't get old. Uh, when I don't hear Charles hoot even on his own, like today I just stopped by there quickly after work because I have to prepare for this. It was great to see him, but it was just lacking that little extra edge that hearing them hoot gives. So let's watch another video of them duetting, and they're really much further along in the duet. Uh, they're kind of in about fifth gear. Sarah is higher up on the left, and Charles is on the right. And listen how they're hooting over each other, overlapping. You'll even hear perhaps Charles putting kind of a cooing, purring edge to his hoot. Also listen for some not-so-happy warning calls from Eastern Gray Squirrels who are going, Great, they're waking up, hon. <laughs> They've done, they did more hoots <coughs> in the first 10 seconds in this video than they did in that entire video, of, which was of an even longer length. So that really shows, okay, we're really getting into the duet. Now, mating itself, the actual act of mating, usually occurs at the peak of a duet, just like that. I mean, one of the reasons I was filming that video for such a long time was I thought they could mate at any second. Now, occasionally, this is in my experience been the exception, they will duet very briefly and then mate. I mean, two, three, four, five hoots back and forth and then, oh, they're mating. How about that? Mating is very brief and it is a rarely seen occurrence. And this uh, mating is definitely something that highlights how much we still have to learn about great horned owls. Uh, this is the most widespread commonly found owl in North America, that mating was not observed and described in the scientific literature until the 1990s. <coughs> now, just as an example, no one has ever seen great white sharks mate. Now that's a little more challenging <coughs> given where they live and some of the dangers they pose, but this is literally an owl that you can find from Arizona to Alabama, Calgary to Cancun, and other alliterative geographic references. Um, and I've been very lucky to have seen them mate over a hundred times. In fact, this year alone I saw them mate 22 times. And occasionally each year they will mate twice on the same night. So it's a very, very brief process, but I will show you 
a video from earlier last year. I'm just going to advance it. Sarah is in the frame, and you hear her hooting at Charles from off camera. And Charles will fly over to her, and they will mate. <laughs> something that very few people have seen with their own eyes, uh, be it on video or you know, right there observing that. Um, I'll never forget the first time I saw that, that was Christmas Eve 2006. And this was so little uh, understood and read about that at this point I had done tons of reading on owls and I thought, well that has to be mating, I haven't read about it, let me go back and See what I can find, and very little written about that, and I'm hoping to, at some point, to contribute to that. Uh, my girlfriend Wendy says, you keep saying that, but you haven't done anything. <laughs> I said, I know, I'm so busy doing all the things you've asked me to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a very fascinating process. If you ever get to see it with your own eyes, highly recommend it. Video is cool, but in the flesh is even more interesting. Now this photo some of you have seen before, but I always like to point it out. This goes under the heading of lucky photos, because not only did I get Sarah pretty well captured in flight, but if you look above her you see two owlets staring back at you. Um, one of the most incredible things about great horned owls is all the different places where they nest. Again, most widespread commonly found owl in North America, and out of that comes a wide variety of behaviors including where they nest. They most frequently nest in stick nests of birds kind of close to their size. Hawk, heron, egret, crow, raven. But they'll even nest on the ground if nothing is good. They'll use man-made spaces and places. Uh, but Charles and Sarah have been kind of picky or lucky or both. And so far they have only nested in places like this. Hollows or snags of cottonwoods. And the analogy I've been making lately is, it's yes, they're picky and lucky. Imagine you're in a new town, you don't know where your way around, and you're hungry, and you're not just hungry for any old thing. You say, oh, I want Vietnamese food. And you make a lift, and ta-da, there's a Vietnamese restaurant. You're picky, and you're lucky. So I would be fascinated to see them not nest in the cottonwood, but so far I've been pretty happy with that as well. And as of, more importantly, as have they. They have nested in five different locations, um, and some places they have repeated multiple times. And one tree in particular they have very much uh, honed in on. Um, nesting itself is, um, you want to be careful with nest as a noun and a verb. If you ask me right now, or three months from now, um, where are they nesting? I'd say, well, they're not. Because nesting only means the place and the activities where you have the eggs, where the eggs hatch, and then where that initial stage goes on. Other than that, the verb and uh, nouns you want to use are roost and perch. Where are they perching? Where are they roosting? Um, when they are nesting, Sarah has a very clear division of labor. Sarah does one thing and Charles does the other. Sarah will stay on the nest for over 24, 23 hours a day keeping the eggs warm and safe, and then the youngsters warm and safe, taking only brief breaks to stretch, groom, eat, eject a pellet, and then she's back in there. On uh, Remember the nice night this winter when we had a foot of snow on a Sunday? And then the next night it dropped uh, about to 20 below. Yes, I was out there. Um, usually Sarah's breaks are about three to eight minutes, two to ten minutes long. That night, I don't think she broke two minutes. I mean, she went out and was back in. <laughs> now, I often see uh, kind of folded arms on the women. 
what's Charles doing? Because we're hearing all about Sarah's labor, and we're waiting to hear that he's actually doing something and not sitting on his butt drinking a cold one, watching the game. Trust me, Charles has his talents full. He is doing all of the hunting at this stage. Sarah will only hunt if opportunity presents itself or if Charles is not bringing home the bacon sufficiently. Um, here's the first place uh, they nested, a big hollow branch of a cottonwood, not a trunk, but a very large hollow branch. Um, in 2007, it was very interesting, this was kind of a snag, a broken, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Lim? Li uh, li li <laughs> um, got roots, got a trunk, thank you! Uh, it's going to turn into a game of password, I think. <laughs> um, two syllables. Um, but it, it also looked, but it was kind of hollowy as well. Um, and this hollow, if you looked at it from five different angles, it looked different each one, including an angle that looked like there was no opening there at all. So very interesting spot. Um, in 2008, this very large hollow in the trunk that we saw in that first picture of Sarah flying out. 2009, that was the first time they repeated a place, and they used the same spot as 2006. Uh, and this is Charles actually at the edge of the nest. Uh, we have had uh, several times this year included of Charles, especially the early part of nesting, standing in front of the actual opening and Sarah down further out of sight. Uh, a pretty cool thing to see one owl, and then he would wake up and fly off, and then out would come Sarah. So kind of need to see two owls in one spot. 2010 was quite different. This was um, the first tree not in the area I call the arena. Most of um, all of the places except 2010, they have nested in this one particular area in the park, very defined area. Uh, this was about 100 to 150 yards uh, southeast out of it, a very large uh, snag. And if you look right here, you can see an owl eye Owlet eye looking right back at you. Now this crack in the tree that the owlet is peering out of, that was about all we could see into the nest that year. Even though it was about, even at my paltry height, even at about eye level, we still had this tiny little crack. It's like saying, okay, I think I see Ted, or well, maybe that's Chris. Uh, okay, I give up. Um, very challenging spot, but very neat to see. Um, yet to be repeated, but um, I would not be surprised if they went back. In fact, in the fall of 2008, they checked this tree out a great deal, and uh, a lot to be said about that spot. 2011, this was in the same tree as 2006 and 2009, but a different hollow branch, and that was very interesting to see. We'll definitely be talking about that spot. 2012, back in the same spot in 2008. As you can see from this picture, this is one of the best spots for human observation, very much at eye level, and it faces almost due west, and the sun would just pour in there. You get these beautiful views of Sarah just enveloped in the, the golden hour of life. 2014 and 2013 uh, was quite interesting. A, the same spot as 2011, but it was the first time they repeated a spot in consecutive years. They've never done that before. Uh, also a, a lucky shot uh, category winner. Uh, you can see the two owlets just faintly as Sarah comes bombing out of uh, the nest. Um, I, I think Charles and Sarah haven't repeated a spot because they haven't needed to. Um, our, our friend and uh, fellow owl addict, Brenda Henke, is here, and her owls uh, live in a smaller park in the St. Louis area, and they've nested in the same spot three years in a row. And I think it's partly because that's what is there. Um, you know, it's like going to a neighborhood, you're looking to buy a house, and there's one house for sale. That's what you're going to get. That's, a, that's the um, thing when I have in this. There you go. Show me on that. Yes, yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah, I always, always, always show this tree, uh, especially pointing out how the 0609 branch uh, broke off. 
Now, in terms of the number of alice they had, uh, they have had 21. Uh, two to three is average for the species, as well as Charles and Sarah. Um, Wendy has a very cold clinical term for these big fluffy feathers. She calls it the fluff. Um, so they had two in 06, uh, one in 07. Here he is getting mobbed by common grackles and American robins. Uh, three in 2008. Now, that was the first year I named the alice, and I named them that year because I really needed to keep track of them. Because when they have more than one allet, they lay their eggs at different times. And this is called asynchronously. And the eggs usually hatch in the order in which they've been laid. So you have an oldest, youngest, if you have two. And if you have more than two, you have an oldest, middle, and youngest. As the uh, fifth of six children, I'm sensitive to these family dynamics. Um, so I wanted not just any names, but also names that gave me that age order. And that didn't take me long. I've been a Simpsons fan for years, and I just said, hey, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, after the kids and the Simpsons. Um, they had two in 09, and this began uh, another naming tradition that I've often used, naming the Alice after uh, people, family, friends, friends of family, family of friends, um, sometimes even uh, a pet of a friend that had passed away within the last year or so as a way of uh, paying tribute to them, uh, in memoriam naming, and that year uh, they were named Art and Mo. Uh, Mo was the very long-lived and much-loved cat of our friends Barb and Chris here. Um, and we're going to be talking about Mo a little, some more later on. He was quite the owl. Yes, Tammy? Um, okay, how can you tell owl its sex? What is a nest made out of? And they only do one set or triplets or whatever yes. per year. Hold, can you hold those questions? Those yeah. are all excellent questions. Okay. They generally don't make a nest. They just take over a place that works for them. Uh, they might line it with some feathers from the female's stomach, uh, but they don't make a nest. But definitely hold those other, other questions. Um, 2010, another cool year where they had three again. And that was uh, one of a couple of nights where I was able to literally come off one of the bike paths and there were all three Alice standing right in a row as if to say, Mother, we're ready for our portraits at Sears now. <laughs> and I always like to show Malcolm in the middle about a big family, so I named him after the kids, Reese, Malcolm, and Dewey, or some of the kids. Uh, 2011 was another in memoriam naming uh, Monica after uh, my Aunt Monica who had passed away that year, and Dalton after Barbara and Alice's late father, Dalton. And um, I always get permission, um, ask permission, uh, if I'm going to name them after someone not directly related to myself or whoever's, you know, a close relation to them. Um, 2012, uh, Christopher and Velvet, they're a pretty cool little pair. Uh, 2013, this was a great night to literally walk into the woods and find them not only lined up, but at very close range. Um, and they were named Lawrence, Edward, and Stuart. Now this picture is, is quite telling because it really shows some of the results of that asynchronous hatching. Notice how they all look a little different. Lawrence, the Edward, uh, the oldest, looked noticeably more like an adult than Stuart and Edward. And they even left the parents' territory at different ages at the in their age order as well. So we really need to see that. This year, another fascinating new first, along with the same nest site as, this, as the year before. It's the first time that I've ever have seen them have three owlets in back-to-back -back years. And uh, this is uh, all three owlets together um, just uh, back on April 10th. And I thought, why not? Let's do another picture of them. This was all three of them last night. Um, for those of you playing the home game, this is the bushy tree. Um, as some, if not many of you know, I have different names for uh, different trees and groups of trees that the owl, owls use. And this is something I began to do very quickly, and it's been very helpful because folks like Barb and Brenda and Chris, who come out quite a bit, um, know these names of these trees and we can tell each other what we saw. In fact, Brenda was out early this morning enjoying Easter Monday off from work 
And she texted me and told me where all five owls were, and I had an excellent idea of where every one was. Not just the owls, but also their parents. Um, so the, the naming does have a, there's a method to the madness. So, now we've had a kind of our topical, chronological overview, let's look at a couple of different topics and procedures and milestones. And one of the first ones, of course, is nest selection, picking where to go. 2007 was the first time I saw that happen, and there is Charles standing on top of the hollow snag, hollow branch that they used, um, and that was quite typical. Uh, the male, as in most things, the male has a role, but it's the female who does the actual decision making, the heavy lifting. And Charles, like most males, will kind of say, will kind of be the real estate agent. Okay, we have this in the hollow. It's very nice. It'll keep it covered from the rain. Uh, very good schools. But Sarah actually makes the decision. And it, that was just fascinating to see that for the first time. Charles go into that hollow. Okay, that's interesting. Let's watch this. And then Sarah follow him. Now, during... Um, just a quick little side note, during, while she was nesting in that hollow, Charles began to just every two, three weeks, check out another hollow on his own. Just kind of go in there, hang out for a bit. I kind of realized, well, this is a little bachelor cave, a bachelor pad, his man cave. And that ended up becoming the 2008 nest, that big westward facing one. So that was really neat to, well, often you should just have to watch them and not really leap to a conclusion, but just keep an eye on that. I just want to see what's going to happen with that. 2011 was quite different. They checked out a few other spots, but they really focused in on this one hollow. And what was interesting about this hollow is that before the fall of 2010, I had barely seen the look of this hollow, like no more than a handful of times over a period of you know, several years. And in the summer of 2010, this hollow got this new opening. This opening here, the smaller one on the left, had, was the original opening, but we had a big storm in the summer of 2010, and it ripped this portion out, creating a second opening. And they checked out that hollow more in the fall of 2010 than at any other spot. And well, eventually, that's where they started to nest. And they, I first saw Sarah in there, actually on that date, December 19th, and I had kind of been worried that they were going to pick it, and then I was really worried when they did pick it, because the nest was in a tree, and low, and right next to one of the bike paths. And knowing how defensive the females can be, I worried about people getting attacked by Sarah, who were just innocently riding a bike, or going for a walk, or a jog, or a cross-country skiing, we do see that sometimes in the park. Um, and I also worried about the owls getting disturbed, again, by people just innocently going about their business. Um, now, through my work, I've gotten to know a lot of the nature folks in Forest Park forever, and I emailed them and expressed my concerns and said, hey, should we rope this off? You know, here's why. Um, and they very wisely said, let's just wait and see what happens, just as I was Say we should, but even I get worried sometimes and want to uh, take active measures. And it was quite interesting because a few nights later, it was almost like Sarah had read my email and took action upon it. You know, she may have said, you know, I'm a great horned owl, and I know more about being a great horned owl than this joker ever will. But, you know, even, you know, amateurs get lucky sometimes. You know, Mark does have a point. I'm going to check out a few other places. And boy, did they ever, because... On December 22nd, it was almost like an HGTV show was born. In a 30-minute period, they checked out three other hollows. They had checked them out earlier before in the nest scouting season, but not nearly as much as the one that they first picked. And this is where Sarah finished up at that night. I thought, okay, interesting. Let's come back tomorrow and see what happens, and sure enough, I came back tomorrow and how she flew. Okay, she's made her decision. Now this was a new, 
uh, spot in a lot of different ways. One, they had never nested here before, and two, kind of you know, embarrassingly, I always thought that hollow was too small. That hollow was only a few years old, but I remember seeing it after a big part of that branch broke off, and I thought, wow, that's a nice high overarching hollow. Yeah, it's too small. Um, becoming, uh, studying owls and other nature stuff is definitely a practice makes better type of situation, not a practice makes perfect. I thought I knew what I was talking about in this case. I was wrong. Lesson learned, I hope. Um, for the owls, a great spot, very high up, still in an active area of the park, but not down low near a bike path, very high up, but very challenging for us to see. Seeing Sarah, all 22 to 25 inches of her, was very challenging. Unless they're within about a foot of the opening, you cannot see them. As many of you have seen this nest spot, you know it. It's not just very tall, um, but more importantly, the angle of the branch is very <coughs> steep. And the best vantage point is sort of like going to you know, Chicago skyline and being taken to, you know, a janitor's closet and say, this is the best view of Chicago. Really? Uh, it's a janitor's closet. Well, that's kind of what it is here. The best view, the one that gives you the most insight into that hollow is not showing you all that much. Uh, never mind, it's a little further back, so uh, even telephoto lenses have their limitations. Now, when nesting occurs for Charleston Sarah, pretty typically, and this year was a good example of that, as was 09 in 2012, is late December. Uh, they'll start uh, mating in early December, sometimes even late November, but begin nesting in uh, late December. And uh, this was really cool to see in both 2009 and 2012. The first night Sarah was in the nest was New Year's Eve. Less typical or atypical uh, was early mid December, both 2010 and 2011. They started mating much earlier that year and started nesting uh, much earlier. On the late side was 2008, early to mid January. Um, and studies have shown that can be influenced by rainfall and prey availability. Um, I always just try and trust in them. I mean, it was interesting in. 2010 and 2011, they started mating so early, and when they did in 2012, I thought, oh my gosh, is there something wrong? And I reminded myself, just keep watching, just keep waiting, and sure enough, they began to mate and then nest. Um, when we see the owlets will vary, mo most typically, and this year another good example, was that when they were about three to five weeks of age, and just big enough, especially in some of these harder to observe hollows, just big enough that we could see them and getting relatively long looks at them. Now, 08 was really, really cool because we got very early looks. I mean, this is my first glimpse of an owlet and this tiny, tiny little ball of fluff there. And what was also cool was that we began to see one owlet and one owlet now a little bigger, that slightly bigger ball of fluff. And then eventually we saw two, and then eventually all three right there together. But again, this nest offered the best view that we have ever had. Um, and our best may not be their best. I'll be curious and happy if they use it again, but no guarantee. Um, fledging. Fledging is the process of leaving the nest, making their first flights. Um, before they fledge, they do a process I call hitting the gym. And that basically involves standing and vigorously and regularly flapping their wings to get strength. And I remember seeing some folks, I remember Chris comes to mind, he's like, oh, they're going to fly. I'm like, no, look, they're, they're, their feet are planted. They just have to build up their wing strength. So 2008, this is when we saw the most fledging behavior. We saw the whole process. We saw a lot of hitting the gym. Um, and then the whole fledging was a multi-day, multi-stage process, and I wish I could say I've seen it again in such, such depth, but I have not. Uh, and that's become a, a very special year. The first year that they had three outs, and the first time we saw so much fledging, and Chris was there with me for a lot of it. It was incredible to see. Um, 
They generally will fledge in the order that they've hatched, again, uh, showing the difference in maturation and growth. Um, and this was interesting. Uh, Lisa, uh, the middle one, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, well, she was the first to go. Chris found her uh, in that nest. And Chris said, oh, hey, she flew to the nest. I said, well, maybe. Uh, I would say it's probably part of the three Fs, fly, fall, and flail, along with walking and climbing. Owls aren't very graceful on their feet, but the owls thankfully have good climbing skills and they can climb straight up a tree just with their talons. No hands. Oh wait, we have wings. <laughs> um, so there was Lisa out of the nest. Meanwhile, uh, Bart was, uh, got out of the hollow uh, as well as Maggie. That is Bart actually between the hollow and the trunk of the tree. And what was this process of then leaving the nest, but uh, not the nest tree, is called branching. And eventually they underwent some flying school on this huge branch just to the left of the nest. Um, Bart would get up on that big branch, nice big wide branch, and he would kind of run and flap and just kind of get little updrafts of air. Like, Ooh, I just flew. Or, I mean, when, you know, when you read about the Wright brothers, one of my brothers, my brother Paul's an expert on the Wright brothers, you know, wow, they only flew 160 feet. Well, still, that's pretty incredible. Um, so amazing to see that. And we actually began to see some first flights, both successes and failures. So let's look at a couple of those. So Maggie and Bart were still in the nest tree. Um, at this point, and you're going to see Maggie go from about this side of the tree up to one of these branches. A short flight, but one of their first flights. I mean, kind of like watching a kid take their first steps. So, poor cameras and such, but there she goes, woo, from one side of the trunk to another. Incredible. We were just thrilled to see that. Now, there were some failures, so by this point, uh, Bart and Maggie had gotten out of the nest tree. They were in the tree just next to it. Uh, it's, it's a tree between whoopsie, um, two nest trees that I creatively call the middle tree, um, <laughs> just to distinguish it. And you're going to see Maggie, I beg your pardon, Lisa, come flying up and trying to join her siblings in this tree and almost get there. Just watch her carefully. Here she comes, flying up, up, up. And then goes dropping down. <laughs> now, if we had a musical score to this, I'm sure we would all pick the, f the you know, nice, nice wavering, descending flutes and patches. <laughs> and we were all concerned and, oh my gosh, is she okay? And I, you know, finally I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to reading. Notice she landed very softly. It wasn't, yeah, bam. She, that was a controlled landing. I said, okay, I've read about this. Let's just keep watching. Sure enough, she kind of took a breath, dusted herself off, <laughs> went back to the tree, climbed up it, and the next night she made it over. So gradual, gradual process, um, and often it can be one uh, that is quite dangerous as well. So um, you know, always want to be careful observing them while they are fledging. Um, 2011, boy, we did not see anything that year in terms of the build-up to fledging. I think I saw that entire nesting time, one of the owls hit the gym once. That's it. And all of a sudden, they had fledged. Uh, Brenda and I went out uh, to uh, the park, and we started off in the woods. We saw Charles, and there's Sarah. I'm like, huh, Sarah's kind of far away from the nest. That's kind of interesting. So we went back, we went down to the nest, looked at the nest, we didn't see anyone. That's not unusual, sometimes they'll uh, wait until they're a little more awake to come closer to the nest. And we went back to the woods to watch Charles and Sarah. All of a sudden I'm looking and there's an outlet right in front of me that had been where I was looking. It was like if I was looking for Ted saying, did anyone see Ted? Ted? See him? 
tall guy, virile. Oh, there he is. And it was like just totally blind. We were just did double takes, double takes, double takes. Now, one of the fascinating things about this little area, and this is a, a, an area of the park probably smaller than this room. 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Some of our first views of the Alice having fledged is in this immediate area. And I forget this year, and when I posted pictures of the Alice fledging, I expected a good-natured grief from Brenda and Rusty and some others saying, sure, they're in the same areas. Sure, that's not a picture from last year or the year before or the year before that. Um, but just incredible to see that consistency, um, even in dif different nest locations. Where they fledge is pretty typical. It is the woods and even that uh, minor, air, uh, minor that, uh, distinct area. Uh, and again, slowly but surely. Um, what was very different was Mr. Mo. And I told you I'd, I'd talk about Mo. Mo was very much the alif that broke the mold. Because not only did he not go to the woods, he went in the opposite direction. Um, Brenda, I beg your pardon, Barb, Chris, and I spent a lot of time after um, his sibling Art had left the nest, still trying to see Mo in the nest. You guys remember this? Mm -hmm. We're like, yeah, we're just trying to get the best angle. It was a challenging nest spot. We're like, yeah, we're not seeing him, we're not seeing him. And finally, one night, I happened to, I'll, I'll cut, trim some of the story. Um, I went out to another area of the park and found Mo. Instead of going just back to the woods, he had gone 80 yards in the. You know, and a night, you know, if he needed to go one way, he had gone 90 degrees in the wrong way. And he was getting mobbed by robins, and there he is, this poor little Alan, all on his own, getting mobbed. And I was very grateful later on to see Sarah with him, that Sarah knew where he was, and that she was keeping an eye on him. And I thought, well, he's going to get back over to the woods. No, he just kept going west and west. And West, Barb, Chris, uh, Wendy, and myself one night followed him out to his now even further west spot, and we saw Charles and Sarah fly over to him with food. Actually, it was Sarah, and by this point, he was about a hundred plus yards away from the woods, and they had food. And they said, "You want this? You need to come follow <laughs> us back to the woods." And the owl had made this long flight. Yes, success, we've made it. When I was at work the next day, Chris gave me a call and sounded rather grim. I said, Mark, you're not gonna believe it. I said, what? He's back on the other side. <laughs> he had gone all the way close to the woods and had gone right back. But even then he wasn't done. He kept going a little further west and then his sibling Art joined him for a little while. He said, I'm gonna go over there. And then Art went back to the woods. And then Art went back hanging out with Mo and stayed there the rest of the summer. Now, that was probably the busiest summer I've had because do I start with trying to find Art and Mo over here or do I start on another side of the lake too over here with Charles and Sarah? No matter where I started, I still had to go find the others and keep an eye on them. So very fascinating. Challenging summer. So many of you have been out on prowls and have heard the begging of the owlets. I want to show everyone a very nice picture Lucy did of an owlet. And the owlet is saying, feed me. <laughs> because the other day she got to hear the owlets doing that. They're raspy, sometimes whistling, begging cheap. And it's a constant call, a human baby would kind of chime in, um, and it basically say, Mom, Dad, we're over here and we're hungry, and in case you've forgotten, we're going to do it uh, until you give us food, and then even after you give us food, uh, we'll wait a little bit and then we'll start doing it again. Uh, what's also fascinating is that they can throw their voices, and this is always challenging this year again, 
okay, we know when it's fledged, and we're hearing calling, we're seeing the outlet, but we're hearing calling from over here. Is that a second fledgling? I don't know. Keep watching and listening. Again, practice makes better. Let's listen to a little begging, shall we? Here is Lawrence begging last year, and you'll hear it again. It's actually very rare to see them make the cheep and hear it. Now the cheep is hard to hear in this video, but you can see the mouth, the bill actually open. This is Stuart last year, down near the ground. Just watch his bill. Crank it up a little. I like the small jack in the box. <laughs> and they will literally do that hundreds of times a night. And um, I did a prowl on Friday. We saw all three owls get fed by Sarah. They all quieted down for a little while and then started to bang right over, right over again. So. One of the ways the parents cope with these hungry, hungry owlets is by storing food. It's called caching food. They will store it, they'll put it in a cache, and then they'll uncache it. Uh, part of that is Charles going into hunting overdrive. There is a very famous uh, description of the nest observed in uh, Charles Bent's Life Histories of North American Birds, where a man went to a great horned owl's nest and found that in the nest were the remains of fish, and birds, several different types of birds, several, several different types of mammals. The food alone in the nest weighed 18 pounds. They had just stored that much food. I've also read descriptions of nests with rabbits kind of spilling outside of it. So Charles is, again, he's doing his part. Um, as more owls start to hatch, they have even more mouths to feed. And, you know, you just can't have super fresh food all the time. And here's Sarah, this picture of Sarah actually caching prey of in 2011. The cache sites can be anything from just up in a tree, and I have seen Sarah use these pine trees. Uh, for those of you playing at home, these are the middle conifers, uh, both uh, in 2011 and uh, this year and other years. Um, but caching is not always successful. Some of the other cache sites include previous nest trees. Let's watch some uncaching. This is a video from late March of last year. This was one of three nights in a row where Sarah went to the now broken 2006-2009 nest hollow, quickly disappeared, but then equally quickly reemerged with prey and flew to the woods, had herself a little bite, and then fed the owlets. And watch as she flies off. You will see very clearly Going to the 0609 hollow, quickly coming out. Beautiful flight. It's there. Almost feeding away and serves a tunnel perch. There she goes. Yep, she's got. Something big in her talons. Well done, sir. Going off to the Great Northern. Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. Hind quarters, two legs. Uh, Eastern Cottontail is definitely a favorite uh, prey item. So caching is not always successful. Uh, on this day, April 11th, 2011, I got to the park and I saw Sarah fly to the Great Northern. Very big tree on the north side of, the, of their uh, woods. and. I've seen them eat there frequently, I've seen them cache food there frequently, and Sarah landed in the tree and started looking around and flew to another branch and continued looking around. And I realized 
she's looking for something that she's cached but can't find. It was quite funny. It was like watching someone <laughs> try to find their car keys. Or my work name tag today. I still haven't found it. Um, but she un... She, very shortly thereafter, I saw her eating something else. Did she catch it right then and there? Perhaps. And then she went to this pine tree and cached it, flew out of the pine tree, and then guess what happened? The prey fell right out of the tree. She had tried to cache it, unsuccessfully. So the bird I still have, been, I, um, uh, still have not been able to identify, um, but it was quite noticeably missing its head. Uh, the brain is often one of the first things that they will eat, um, and it was pretty fascinating to see that, you know, the spinal cord just snapped off like, uh, like a twig. Um, now feeding the owls, this was always one of the coolest things to do. When Sarah, Sarah will do the feeding of the owls. Charles and Sarah will start to hunt um, as uh, the owls get older. When she feeds them, she very carefully closes her eyes as she passes the food to them. They're not very discriminating and skilled about where they place their bill. So for her own protection, she closes her eyes, which is quite neat to see. Um, there can be challenges in getting the owlets some food um, because they have different flying abilities. And I'll show you a couple of different videos. Uh, sometimes the challenges are self-created, as you shall see. Um, eventually they begin a transition to solo eating. And sometimes that can be done quite early if they just manage to get it to them and, okay, you can eat it on your own. But it's very kind of similar to watching the kid going from, okay, we need to spoon feed you to, okay, we're gonna put you in this room and you're gonna make a mess, but at least you're feeding yourself to, oh, I can use my utensils. So a fascinating part of their progression. And yes, Sarah will begin to hunt as the owlets uh, get old get older so that she can leave them alone for a little while and go out and add to the stock of prey. So let's watch uh, Sarah feeding an owlet, uh, uh, an eastern cottontail rabbit, and she uh, gives this owlet a big chunk of food, and just then the second owlet comes over and lands right next to her and actually gets its wing on its sibling's head. It just says they're trying to tuck its wings in. It's a pretty funny little video. Chuck of prey is already yeah. down the hatch. All right, that's like a bit of rabbit, like that big. Mm -hmm. um, last year was really interesting to see how Sarah had to adjust to feed the owls. Some of the owls were uh, flying. One, the oldest was flying pretty well. The second, okay. The third, not so well. At one point, the third got stuck in some low bushes, and it wasn't that it couldn't. You know, that it had its, uh, I'll rephrase that, it wasn't um, able to stand on a tree. It was stuck, suspended from its wings in the branches. Mm. And eventually this owlet got down to the ground and Sarah flew down to the ground and fed it. And you'll get to see the owlet come to Sarah and make the touchdown. And uh, you'll hear lots of begging cheeps. Very hungry owlet. And you'll see Sarah actually leave the prey with the owlet that it can eat on its own at this point. Really yeah, so I'm down there filming this like that. <laughs> yeah, so she is allowed to take bites. She's got to feed, so she can feed them. Camera tab. <laughs> Thrilling to see that. I mean, the effort that went into that is just on Sarah's part, on the Alice's part, just mind boggling. Now, hey, 
I got a good chunk of food that I can take care of at my own pace. But we still have other hungry owls in the area. Um, on, what day is this? Wednesday. Sarah uncashed some food. I'm pretty sure that is what happened. And she's in a sweet gum. And you can see a nice view of her uh, feeding the owlet. And then I'll show you a second video where much happens in a pretty brief span of time. So notice how Sarah holds the prey down with her talons, tears it up with her mouth, and gives it over to the owlet. Sometimes it's hard to get that bite torn off. Sometimes she gets a small bite that she has to eat on her own while the outlet just grooms itself. Very hungry outlet. Windy day. Very lucky to see that just still quite light out and very clear, unobstructed, but safe view. It's safe from my concern, but more importantly from their perspective. What did the owl do at the last minute? It looked like he tried to bite his mother. Uh, earlier, uh, Bridget, I can from that same night, I can show you uh, pictures of the owl in a quest to get food biting Sarah on the head, like more than once. So Sarah is going to uh, continue to feed the owlet, and one of the owlets will join them, and Sarah will start to pass a big chunk of food to this owlet here, but watch what happens to the food. And watch Sarah's reaction, it's quite priceless. She was passing a rabbit's foot with leg attached, and the rest of the rabbit just dropped straight down. <laughs> and true to her adaptable nature, she flew to a nearby tree to get a better angle to get to the prey, flew down to the ground very carefully, looked around, flew off into the woods, or there's still one out in the woods, and went over to a very large log and left the prey there. And that owlet went over and started oh. to feed. And eventually, both owlets that were on this sweet gum went back into the woods and were kind of waiting their turn. But just to see that prey drop, and Sarah looked down. It's just it's like watching any of us do one of those amazingly brilliant, stupid things we do where there's no one and nothing else to blame but our cells. I was just, so, I so can't she, believe I did that. She retrieved it. She retrieved it. And took it. And took it to, to the, the other alley. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, so she uses food to guide them where she wants them to be. Sometimes. Sometimes, like with Mo, like, hey, we're going to get you over here. <laughs> but yeah, that was just an amazing night. Uh, some of the stills I was able to get were, were quite striking <laughs> as well. Um, flying and landing. They learn how to fly pretty well, pretty quickly. Landing takes a lot longer, and one of the fascinating things with their long uh, maturation process is just how gradual it is. It's like seeing someone build a highway one pebble at a time. And every flight, every landing is a learning experience. They just get better and better with each one. Um, one of the really neat things to do in the summer 
um, is to come out and try and play what owl am I watching? Because you'll see a big owl flying through the woods or out of the woods making a knife flight and you just can't see enough to say, is that Charles Sayre or one of the owls? And then you see him land <laughs> badly and hey, it's an owl. Um, landing spots also don't always match their landing skills. When I first began to watch the owls, I would notice them pick a branch and they'd be trying to balance and trying to balance and I thought, you know, that branch just can't support their weight. And then the more I thought about it, the more I watched, I realized, wait, I've seen Charles and Sarah land on a dime and they can do that because they know how to land well. These guys aren't picking the right spots for their abilities. One of the coolest things with three outlets is seeing them play follow the leader. And we saw a bit of, we've seen actually quite a bit of that in recent days. Uh, one outlet will fly to a branch, and then the second will join them, and then the third. And, you know, again, it's one of you know, many siblings, it's kind of classic sibling behavior. I'm imitating you, whether it's smart or dangerous or everything in between. So here's some Fall of the Leader from 2010. Here are some Bengi Chiefs as well. There's the first outlet. Notice the landing, not too good. Very windy day, though. Number two. Fluff blowing in breeze. Boom. Three for three. Now, follow the leader doesn't always work out. Um, Sometimes they don't know that, hey, maybe I shouldn't land here. We're going to see uh, this Alex get joined from the left by a second Alex, but uh, he has a bit of surprise in for him when he lands. <laughs> Straight down. We saw that at uh, one point this year, and Alex just taking an express elevator right down to the basement. Man, it's a swoop up and land safely. Follow the leader. Can go bad sometimes. Always fascinating to see that. Part of their whole very slow road to maturation independence is starting to hunt. And that's the thing that takes them the longest. One of the first things they do is predatory play. And you're seeing an example of it here. Branch nibbling. The other predatory play that they do is branch attacking. They'll fly down to the ground and grab a stick or a branch and tear at it just like it's prey and fly back up to a tree, tear at it some more, and then drop it and then start all over again. You know, we're not playing full on tackle football with pads, we're using the nerf, we're going to be kind of gentle, we're gradually going to learn how to hunt. One of the other things that they do when they begin to hunt is start with insects and then work their way up to bigger prey. And again, it's this constant learning process. I remember a night in 2008 very well. Alec went for a squirrel, and he missed. And not just, you know, well, he missed. I mean, he missed by a Montana mile. Like, you weren't even in the same zip code. A couple of weeks later, I don't know if it was the same Alec, but in that same exact area of the park, Alec went for a squirrel and missed by a much shorter margin. And not only was the margin shorter, guess what? He tried again. Oh wait, I didn't get the squirrel, but there it is. I'm gonna go right to the squirrel again. So fascinating just to see them get better and better and better. And let's look at an example of such a learning process. Uh, this is Dalton in 2011. You're gonna see him come uh, flying in and land on kind of a, a, a broken trunk and he's going to have a little adventure with the squirrel. And you can kind of see him like recognizing that that's something I want to eat. How do I do this? <laughs> and the squirrel isn't taking it lying down. The squirrel has something to say. So look at the base of the tree, you'll see the squirrel. Run down, and uh, we're still not done. Monica. 
charges Dalton right off. And then he whisks the landing. And you can practically hear him go, okay, what's the takeaway from that? <laughs> Um, and again, repeated and repeated, night after night, just getting slowly and slowly better. Mm. One of the fascinating things about Great Horn Owls, here they are nesting in winter and all this, is that they're very much an all-year owl, but they're really built for the cold weather. I mean, people ask me at work all the time, uh, Tammy's a colleague of mine at Fog Pump, you know, how are the owls doing this cold? Uh, fine. I mean, on some of the really cold nights, you can see them kind of grinning and burying it. But I'll be out there, seven layers, you know, <laughs> balaclava, hat, two pairs of gloves, boots, two pairs of socks. They're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Summer, though, is the hard time for them. Um, and you're seeing two ways they keep cool in the heat. One of them is venting their wings instead of keeping their wings vented, say like my jacket. They'll open their wings like we're seeing Velvet do there. And they'll also spread out their talons. You know what it's like on one of those really, really awful sticky days where you don't want one finger to touch the other and one toe to touch the other. You just want to be kind of suspended in cool air. That's one of the things they do. Another thing they do is the owl version or bird version of sweating. It's called guler fluttering. They rapidly move their throats. That allows them to um, exist and continue at a high temperature without overheating. You know, dogs sweat, I mean dogs pant, we sweat, birds guler flutter. So let's watch some guler fluttering. This is uh, Christopher in 2012. And you can see lots of guler fluttering. They'll also do this when they're nervous, excited, just like we do when we're nervous and excited. We sweat. Huge talons, too. Opening their bill, another way to cool down. Now, if it gets really, really bad, one of the things that they will do is actually drink. Uh, Great Horn Owls really don't drink water that much, and all the time I've been watching them, I've seen them take a drink fewer than 10 times. Um, and a lot of those have been Sarah, just as she's beginning to nest. Um, Check out some of my blog posts from uh, late December, early January. We got some really cool footage of Sarah drinking. And one night, Sarah tried to drink because the waterway was mostly covered with ice, and she was actually walking on the ice, and at times actually slightly sliding on the ice, like she was ice skating, uh, trying to find an open area to drink, which she eventually did. Now, here's a video of Velvet drinking. And I remember making a note on this day. This was one of the triple digit days. This was like 105 this day in 2012. Now, this is in a small creek. You won't see her actually hit the water, but you will see her uh, definitely bend down and take several drinks. So watch how carefully she watches between she takes the, when she takes a sip. Very careful, very vigilant. <coughs> Kind of feels good on her feet as well, being in slightly cooler water. So really, really neat thing. That was one of the, probably the first time I've ever seen an outlet drink, which was just incredible to see. Uh, one of the last fascinating behaviors that I really haven't seen much of, but what I can see I'm really psyched, is what we're seeing here. It's a mutual grooming behavior called alloprene. And it's thought to have a couple of different purposes. One, both sort of a practical grooming. Hey, can you get this spot that I can't get to? Um, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's also thought to be just, hey, I'm kind of curious. How does this work? Let me see how it works on you. 
as well as a bonding exercise. A very beautiful behavior to see. Um, and that was uh, Velvet and Christopher in 2012. And here's a video from that same day. Uh, very cute, uh, very sweet behavior. Move the back a little. And they often will concentrate on the legs and feet. See a little feather go fly off there. Now, after months and months and months of very careful care of the owls, of the owlets by Charles and Sarah, it's time for them to go. And this process is called dispersal. And it's a very key process um, for a couple of reasons. One, if the owlets didn't leave, they would just wipe out all their food. There wouldn't be enough food for them to have that many owls in that place for uh, a time with no due date. Unlike the library card, no due date. Um, also, it's very important that they keep their uh, gene pool nice and deep and rich and healthy. For the owls to disperse, it's a two-step process if need be. The first step always happens, and the uh, parents, a lot of youngsters, usually of like teenagers, early 20s, are always intrigued to hear this. They're like, ooh, that's a good idea. The first step always happens. The parents stop feeding the kids. <laughs> You'd probably leave too. You'd be like, I'm out of here. Um, the second step only happens if the owls stick around or if they leave and come back. And the parents will actually chase their youngsters. This is a still from the next video I'm going to show of Charles on July 29th chasing one of the owls clear across the hill. Uh, government Hill, in fact, and they fly so far they're out of my horizon line. And this was the last, last night I saw one of the owls that year. They started much earlier that year, so. Totally out of my horizon line. Can't see him anymore. Um, and it's it's a bittersweet time. I, I will say that you know it's good to see Charles and Sarah get back to their own routine. Um, each year, uh, Wendy's sincere hopes are arise once again, and her inner every year her inner toddler, inner three year old comes out and says. Well, may, maybe this year they'll let the owlets stay, and and then they'll have more owlets, and then they'll have a a big family. And I remind her, no, that's that's not how it works. I pat her on the head and remind her that she needs to finish filing her taxes and doing other grown up stuff. Um, but it's nice to it's a nice thought, but it's just not how it works. So now very little rest for the parents. The last few years have been great examples of this. Last year, the last night we saw one of the owls was September 17th. They had hatched almost seven months earlier. Charles and Sarah were back mating again on December 9th. And that whole time in between the owls leaving and Charles and Sarah mating again, they're not in the hot tub going, Haha, the kids are gone. More champagne, Charles? Well, don't mind if I do. No, they're back with where we started with this talk. Duetting, re-proclaiming their territory, reinforcing the borders of their territory, and re-cementing their pair bond. So their breeding process is the vast majority of a 12-month period. So a lot of work. Um, we are in a library, and 
Hogan and Sam would be here by now um, because I have a gift for the Maplewood Public Library. Um, as most of you know, I work in libraries. Wendy works in libraries. Libraries are very important for me. When I first started this, I had one book on owls, uh, and now I have over 40 of them. And the vast majority of these books I have checked out from libraries time and time again before saying, you know, this is a book that I need to own uh, so I can have it at my fingertips, but also so that other people can use it. Um, and libraries are just such an amazing place to get expert work on owls or anything else you're into for little or no cost. And uh, we are really lucky in the St. Louis area. This is not always the case. The major library systems have what's called reciprocity agreements between them. I live in the city of St. Louis. I can get a card and have a card for the city of St. Louis, the St. Louis Public Library System, St. Louis County Library System, the St. Charles City and County Library System, and the libraries in the Municipal Library Consortium like Maplewood. I live in the city, the libraries have worked this out that, okay, we're all working with taxpayers, let's pool our resources. No library has everything. This is a, what they in military terms, call a force multiplier. I can take the fact that I'm a tax-paying library patron and have access to so much materials. Now, if uh, the public libraries aren't getting you everything you need, don't be shy about coming to, say, see us uh, at uh, the Fontbonne University Library and other academic libraries. Um, you may not be able to check out materials, but you can certainly use our facilities and use our materials. If you do have an affiliation with the university, I'm an alum, I'm a parent, you might be able to uh, have borrowing privileges. Um, so don't be shy about them. If you're not good at using libraries, I know it can be a little intimidating, ask the staff. That's what folks like Sam and myself and Dawn are here to do. If you are good at using libraries, trust me, you can always get better. Just a year or so ago, I learned some new ways of searching, which I've used continuously. Um, and really, really use the databases for magazine and journal articles. Uh, those cost a lot of money, and as taxpayers, you're paying for them. If you're going to school, you're paying for them. Definitely use those. So just as an example of some of my favorite OWL materials, both print and web, here is a portion of my OWL bibliography. And Sam, I would like to present to you, if you can come on up, uh, you and the <laughs> Maplewood uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to present you with a book that Maplewood does not own, nor anyone in the Municipal Library Consortium, I checked. Uh, very good work. Uh, this is a reprint of a work that came out in uh, the early 70s on Owls of North America. Uh, excellent details, superb photographs, as well as great personal stories about this guy was an owl addict and did so much work he makes me look extremely lazy. Mm -hmm. So thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to do that. So I'd like to just conclude by inviting all of you who haven't been already, or if you have been, to come out again on an Owl Prowl. Uh, if you don't have one of my cards, we've got them on the back. I have them on me. It's very easy. Just uh, my card has all my information. Just email me. We'll set up a date and time. And I'd really like to thank you guys for Maplewood for having me come and speak here, and for all of you for attending. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes, Tammy. I forget what my other questions were. What do they make the nest out of? How do I know the sex of the owls? I don't know the sex of the owls. Um, and here's what's reassuring, but also challenging. And here's Ryu, Pip, and Lucy. And all of us can make a contribution. There is uh, still a lot to learn about great horned owls. The sex ratio, how many boys, how many girls do great horned owls have? No one knows. The American Ornithological Union puts out or put out in the late 90s, uh, kind of state of the state monographs on every bird species in North America. And the section for great horned owls of areas of further research goes on and on and on and on. And under sex ratio, unknown. Now, they obviously have enough boys and enough girls that they keep having great horned owls. 
but no one knows that. With the names, so I'm basically paired, flipping a coin. Um, Am I right? Am I wrong? I have no idea. So unless they're paired, you're not really sure. Yes. Oh. Or you wait till they're adults and you hear their adult call, or you capture them and do a rather up close, invasive, personal, rather personal examination of them. And I do not have the permits or, frankly, the guts to do that. <laughs> um, so I never know. Hmm. Yes. Do they, do they ever um, tag the owls and follow them? Like, do they go to other states or? These particular ones or in general? Well, well just say, let's hmm. say one of the owls. In, in general, oh yes, they, uh, bird banding is done quite extensively. Um, there is a gentleman, a legend uh, in Canada, well, in bird banding circles, he lives in Canada. His name is Steve Stewart Houston. He has been banding birds since he was a kid in the 1940s. And the bird species that he has banded more than anyone else by a huge margin has been great horned owls. And he's written uh, several uh, scholarly articles and presented at conferences. Um, and this guy's a radiologist and a medical professor. I think he's retired now. Uh, I'm pretty sure he is. Um, but he has done incredible work and also gathered people around him to do work. I don't have um, a banding permit. Um, and even if I did, I, I probably, I, as much as I would want to know where the owls would go, if there's any sort of element of trust between myself and the owls, I think trying to ban the youngsters could destroy that. Yeah. Um, I would love to know. And, and now with uh, even better technology, GPS tags and things like that, people are getting incredible data. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. and I regularly read the Washington Post online. And they were just tracking some ospreys that were born in the D.C. area, migrated down to South America right. and have come back all the way to like the same spot in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Where the youngsters disperse is usually a pretty healthy distance. It can be very close and quite far. Of course, you're going to have extremes. I've read of a case of, oh, I hatched here. I'm going to set up a territory two miles over there. Uh, one of the owls that C. Stewart Houston banded, he banded in uh, Alberta or Saskatchewan, and he found it over a thousand miles later in Illinois. Oh. Yeah. So the average maximum dispersal distance is about 100 miles. Yes, Tammy. Do they tend to mate with their siblings? No, Have that's why that's attacked? why they disperse. Mm -hmm. No, they, okay. they want to spread out that so gene pool. So by the instinct, they don't. Yeah, it's like, hey, your siblings might hang together for a while, but they're going to definitely disperse. That's not, you know, that is an ingrained thing that, okay, eventually I'm going to go over here and you're going to go over here. You might end up in O'Fallon, Missouri, and I might end up in O'Fallon, Illinois, but we're not going to be in the same area. Have you ever been attacked, and do you know how long owls live? Um, have I ever been attacked? No. I'm, I'm very grateful to say that I have not even had a, a real threatening gesture made by Charles or Sarah. I've had them fly 80 feet from me, and 40, and 20, and 10, and 6, and 2. I mean, I've had them literally go right by me, you know, reach out and touch someone. Um, but it's never been in a threatening or aggressive manner. Um, how long do they live? Here's another area where we have lots to learn. I want, you, I want to see you guys, uh, when I'm in my 80s, that yes, Pip and Lucy have figured out that the <laughs> average age of a great horned owl is, we don't know it right now. Um, the records are well known, but that's like any other record. That's uh, an outlier, it's an extreme. Uh, the record is 28 years and seven months. I'm speaking of bird banding, this was a great horned owl that was banded as an adult. They don't know how old it was when they banded it. Three was a five was a two, um, but yeah, they can live quite long. A lot of them do not make it past the first year, um, and even those that do, a lot of them will not make it past the second year. When you're a top of the food chain predator, there still has to be something limiting your population, and for great horned owls, uh, that can be predators at a young age, uh, as it can also be starvation and unfortunately man-made things. My biggest concern with Charles and Sarah in the park is cars. Mm -hmm. And I've seen them frequently fly over the road 50, 40, 80 feet, you know, there we are. And other times like 12, 18 inches. And you're just like, oh, don't do that. Uh -huh. So, other questions, comments?
Yes, ma'am, please. How far around can their heads turn? They look so... So flexible, yes. Flexible. Excellent question. Um, here, here's my verbal challenge. All owls' eyes, that can be a tough one, um, are so large that they, except for microscopic movements, they can't move their eyes in their sockets. So here I am, standing straight ahead. I can see most of you. I can see the pink book truck. I can see the laptop. See the edge of my arms. That whole peripheral vision thing, they can't do. They've evolved to compensate for that with very flexible necks. We have seven bones, seven vertebrae in our necks. All owls have 14. And they can go between 180 and 270 degrees horizontally. And they can also put their chin where their forehead is. That's about my limit. I'm sure a, a yoga practitioner might be able to do a little better than my paltry 80 degrees. Um, but uh, yeah, a fascinating thing. The first night that I saw them, it was just dark enough that I couldn't tell, are they facing me or do they have their backs to me? So I really need to see that. Yes, sir? Do, uh, do, they, or do, do you fight, feel they're accepting you? Um, I. I I think there is an element of acceptance and perhaps even recognition. And I, I would attribute that to, to three things. One, the frequency with which I go out. Uh, I mean, five or six nights is an average week, as many of you guys know. You know oh, wow, I didn't see the owls and I didn't even see Mark. Is, uh, a, a not, uh, you know, has, has been heard more than once before. Uh, you guys know I tend to be well camouflaged. Um, but I'm still easier to find than the owls. Um, so frequency and longevity, I've been doing this for over eight years. But jumping off of the camouflage, I think the most important factor is how I act. Um, we all go to Forest Park for a host of different reasons. We bike, we go to museums, zoos, we picnic, we just sit and watch the clouds go by. Regardless of what we do, even crazy things like watching owls for eight years, all of those activities have the same conclusion. We pack up and go home. The owls and everything else that lives there, they are home. And it's important and incumbent upon us to be a good guest. If you were to have me over to your home, and I kind of barged through the door, went to the fridge, got a beer. Do you have any good beer? Yeah. <laughs> Who's the book brunette? Oh, your mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> right then, you, you just did two things. You mentally shortened my stay. Oh, actually, Mark, I, you know, I forgot I'm having a root canal in 10 minutes. Can you go? <laughs> Two, you never have me back again. Um, so how I behave, how close I get to the owls, how gradually I've gotten close to them is a very important factor. How I dress, how I talk, how I move, all of that is hopefully building some element of trust or recognition, but I don't bank on that. That's one of those things that you build every time you're out there. You know, I don't say, yeah, they know me and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We can think of folks like the Grizzly Man and other people like that where those situations end badly for all parties. Um, and you do see the owls react differently depending on how people are behaving. Uh, a number of us know of a photographer who despite our impassioned and reasoned uh, request to him to not get so close, he gets too close. And you see his pictures, he's got a great camera, he's got a great lens, and he gets these very close, crisp pictures of owls that are often at the least kind of annoyed, and at the worst, ticked off. Like, get out of my face. You know, if I, you know, I see it, the hint of that the owls are making one of their less than happy looks. I'm going to come back in five, ten minutes. I'm going to give you, and I'm not going to get this close. So a lot of it is how you act. Yes, ma'am. Would it be possible to put a small camera in the nest? Um, I had a, just to put this very briefly, I had a series of discussions with the St. Louis Zoo about doing that. Unfortunately, uh, those discussions came to naught, um, and I would like to revisit that. Um, uh, there is a very 
Uh, probably some nest cams of all sorts of different birds, the Decora, Iowa bald eagles. Uh, there's a very cool nest cam, uh, still going out now that the owls have fledged, in Oklahoma City. If you Google OKC owls, um, this family in suburban Oklahoma City has nesting great horns in a garden planter hanging off of one of their balconies. And these owls have gone back to that same place uh, for several years. And you can see the eggs get laid, and the eggs hatch, and uh, everything else. The youngsters fledge, and get fed, and uh, incredible. And I would like to do that so long as we can do it in a way that is safe for, for all concerned. Oh, and have you ever fed them? Uh, here's a rabbit or anything like that? Um, perhaps. This year I found, uh, yeah, speaking of the, the road concern, um, I found a dead male mallard uh, very close to their woods uh, while I was leaving the prowl. And after the prowl continued, uh, uh, concluded, I should say, um, I went back on my own and uh, took the mallard over and actually I put it on the, one of the logs where I seraph drop that rabbit after <laughs> dropping the rabbit um, and I went back the next day and it wasn't there now I thought okay even if the owls don't get it someone else might get a feed from it coyote fox raccoon mink all of the above um, and you know I have had thoughts other times that I see roadkill of see if I can supplement that Charles and Sarah's track record speaks pretty well for them um, you know, they really know what they're doing as individuals and as, as a parental team. Brenda. Yes, Brenda? But you don't, you don't regularly go out and No, oh no, that was like the first. I was like, whoa, right. let's see. No, I just want to confirm that. Right? Yeah, oh yeah, no, that's not something I do regularly by any means. But it was, I mean, the uh, duck was in perfect shape. Uh, you know, they can catch ducks on their own, but I thought this could be a, a nice, little, nice little bonus, you know. Who doesn't like to come home and find dinner already there? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Real pleasure to address you. Have a great night. Thank you. Cool. Thank you guys for coming. You can see all the pictures of the little cuties. <laughs> Uh, I had some time, I hope, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm not now, but I, I very much would like to write a few. Um, so much I've seen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, you know, the, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know why I had to do the law. I don't know you had to do that. So thank you guys so much for coming out again. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Good. Per, per our conversation. I understand. I hope you like what you saw. I like what you saw. Good. Good. Great work. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, definitely come. I'm doing my general owl talk. Bob and Aileen have seen that many times. Um, next month, the Brentwood Public Library. The date is on my website. It's a Sunday at 2 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, it's on like the 18th or something. Yeah. Always my, my next three public talks are on my website. I also do private talks for yeah. yeah. universities and it's schools and other things. I just like to do that. Thanks, Oh, yeah. 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 When they fed the baby. So people weren't bothering them. When you were out, when Julia was yeah. here. Oh, Julia, yes, yeah. from Dallas, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, oh, it's fascinating. And uh, I was uh, getting a little more comfortable yeah. because at one point, either Sarah or Charles, I thought, were coming right you towards me. Oh, wow. Yeah. But yeah. instead, yeah. they were coming to get it on a tree. See, now you have to get a good sight because that was a 10 inch concrete block. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're tiny. 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 they are tiny they Seemed like we were part of the environment then. And, that, and, that, and, yeah. and part of that is making yourself as invisible as possible, yeah. both visually yeah. and sonically. Right. Like, you know, 
Yeah. Hey, look, there's an elevator there. Yeah, we were very quiet. No, it didn't work yeah. out. So it there you go. <laughs> there you go. We were, up, we, were up against, we were up against, you know, huh. Yeah. It was neat. Oh, I'm so glad you had that. And you'll never forget that. Oh, no. No, 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 no. And I mean, all these things, yeah. I mean, watching the videos again, it's like, Shit, I remember that. Yeah. We were about five, almost two hours. You know, we were just mesmerized. Finally got too dark to see anything. Yeah. Oh God, that was so nice. Quite light. When Sarah dropped the prey the other day, yeah, I was like, oh, I, I was just riveted. Yeah. 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 The truest. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks so much. Good to see you. See you later, Mark. How you doing? I'm Mark. Kathy. Kathy. Pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. Oh, How you doing? So oh. Thank you. Thank you. How did How did you hear the song? Um, I saw it. Excellent, excellent. So and you're a maple with the rest of it? Please do, I hope you grab the card. For sure, I do ask, and this is a request, not a requirement, there are no subtle pressures or pictures or anything. If you are comfortable doing so, um, I can do a donation form for this. I ask that people donate. Uh, oh, Forest Park Forever, exactly in my name, and the Owl's name. Oh, this one this morning, I think And this form yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is oh. customized oh, by Forest Park Forever so that they know that so when they get it the with the donation I that oh, no, 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 Mark Love Pride or David Talks. I was over there where you are. Yeah, I was over there today. the other day. It's fired enough that they want to contribute to the court. I was a volunteer for Forest Park Forever. Okay, right there. Yeah, right there. And Forest Park Forever is completely funded by the donation of the Honorable Court. Oh, this is how they get there. I mean, go to almost any area and say, what does this look like? 15 years ago, or even 10, 20. Good. Do you get to the car? No, I don't feel that. As much as I'm out, it can still be more. So, how long does the car last? Generally, about two hours. Would you let a child? Oh yeah, uh, Lucy and uh, Pim, who were just here, um, they were out on the prowl on Saturday. About three is probably the youngest we want to go, but anything about that. Uh, and I, when people contact me for an out prowl, um, once we set the date and I give them the time, I send them a very detailed list. Of house. Yeah, is that that neighborhood area? Exactly. And that, you know, that's, that's you know, kind of. Wow. Sometimes I make this more explicit. Sometimes more explicit that you need to look after your kid, type of thing. You need to be. He just said for years Yeah, you need to be the. You know, they need to know that this is this is going to be quiet. Activity, but something really cool. I mean, it was wow. thrilling to see um, <laughs> yeah, the Pip and the Lucy. I mean, I was 19 when I saw my something first one. Something else to watch there. And I, I can't tell you how many people I've met in well the their 20s and 50s. And we are really beyond. Yeah. We've never seen it now. I think another one comes out. Yeah, yeah, Literally, that was it. At that age. Yeah. And he comes out of the subdivision at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, the dead stuff from the tree. Start climbing up to the wood. Wow. So the tree wasn't very high. Yeah. yeah. It was like eight feet or something. Sure. Yeah. And there's yeah, that. See that now? Right on the street. Right on the road. And the neighborhood was like, yeah. Sure. Right. Sure. sure. But, you, <laughs> but you've never forgotten that. No. no. I mean, and that's one of those things like, in a very pleasant way, you take through the grave. Like, I'll never forget that. I mean, you know, my first sighting of these guys, if you come to my general talk, you'll forget about that. How fun. Totally fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I talked a lot about that in my general talk. I was seeing cool stuff, but I hadn't seen owls yet. And then since seeing the owls, I've seen even more cool stuff. I mean, stuff that I never thought I don't know how you should go to the house. It's really, really cool. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. Yeah, no, no, we were. Um, so, yeah. 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 Y
Easier that way. Oh, that'd be yeah. wonderful. Cool. Thank you. One moment. 